a very deep subject, okay, that we're going to talk about, okay? You guys are like all that nervous and anticipating, okay? It's deep, it's deep because, you know, my heart, you know, of all of the holy masters and on the holy teachers, the Baal Shem Tov has already, always had a very deep place in my heart. So, um, I did uh, merit to go to his kever, right, uh, which is in Mejibuch. The Baal Shem Tov was the founder of the Hasidic movement. As you know, what was going on in Europe at the time, pretty depressing era. Basically, those who were, you know, merited to learn and study and, you know, be in the yeshivas, so they felt they could be connected, and nobody else, the wagon drivers and the water carriers, didn't feel that they could be connected, right? And exile was long, and I think maybe many years before, there was a huge incident with Shabtai Tzvi. As you might have heard, that there was a false messiah by the name of Shabtai Tzvi. It was like maybe 100 years prior to this, or maybe 50 to 100 years prior and it was a false messiah, and he went through Europe, a depressed Europe, a broken Europe, broken community, and basically roused the people to follow him. And of course, what happened at the end with all of the, his followers, they got on ships, and they were going to go to Israel, and they were going to set up the kingdom of the messiah, and everybody was really excited. He had letters, he had ra- rabbis, he had letters from rabbis who gave him credentials, who says, you're in, you're it, right? He used Kabbalistic art, and a lot of charisma. He ended up, because of a storm, they washed in Istanbul. And there they were kind of settling, more or less, in the community there until the, uh, what do you call the king? The sheik? No. What do you call the... the, uh, the what? No, Shah. no, they have a different guy. The sultan. Shah. Sultan <laughs> called him in and says, you either convert or you die. So what did he do? So he converted, which is like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do that. It blew everybody's spirit. The entire world. He wasn't the one because you're not supposed to convert to Islam. Okay? Those are are one of the rules. We don't transgress. (laughs) Especially for a Messiah or a would-be Messiah. What year was this about? Him, Shabtai Tzvi, we'll look it up. I'll look it up at the end. I don't know exactly what year. But, it, but anyways, but the issue was that they blamed the study of Kabbalah for this huge atrocity that happened. And because of that, according to my father-in-law, the study of Kabbalah went three different ways. And it, it eventually, it didn't happen right away, but it basically morphed into the approach. How do you approach the study of the inner wisdom? So... One approach was basically put it away, okay? Don't touch it. You got to be on a certain level. That's where they get, you know, the 40 years old, you have to have kids and all this kind of stuff. That was like the, the Vilna Gon and his students and his following, which basically they would say, you got to learn a lot of Torah and you got to be on a certain level and then you could study this. In the meantime, no, don't touch it. And then there was, on the other side, there was someone by the name of Roshash, Rabbi Shimon Shurabi, who basically took the mystic teachings and he explained them in such a way that it was so complicated that you have to be a super genius to figure it out. So in other words, as soon as you just open up a page, you'll go, ah, I'm out. And then there was the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov came and basically took the mystical teachings, in the, the most deepest mystical teachings, And he brought them down in a way that a person can actually taste a relationship with God, a deep relationship with God. He can actually feel a connection. He brought the Torah, which was always there, and the principles were already there. He just revealed it in a way that enabled the woodchopper and the water carrier, right, to have a connection to God. It was a very innovative style of thinking that he brought out. It they, they, they'll call it the new way to, you know, to practice Judaism, but it really wasn't new, okay? wasn't new at all. 
He just revealed it in a way where it was tangible, where deep things were tangible, and okay, that's good. So, of course, he was, as we know, he lived from 1698 to 1760, okay? So the 1700s, that's when he lived, okay? So in the beginning, though, of course, he was what we call a nister, a nister which means a hidden sadikim. I might have gone over this with you before, that we have in tradition that there are 36 hidden righteous that are in every generation, right? God looked into all of the expanse of his creation, and he says, well, there are not many righteous people. In, in the entire 6,000 years, he went, wow, we better spread them out, right? Don't, don't, right? Don't, don't spend it in one place. So, basically, it is in tradition that actually there's 36 hidden righteous in every generation. Actually, the, the Tikkun Zohar brings down there's 36 in the land of Israel, and there's 36 abroad, outside the land of Israel, which makes a total of 72, okay? But they're hidden. You don't know who they are. You're not supposed to know who they are. And if you think you know who they are, and you try to get close to them, they'll make sure to derail you into absolutely being assured this is not one of them. So do okay? they know that they are one of them? Ah, good question. And I don't know, but I do know that the head of them does know. In other words, the head of the 36, he knows. Okay? Because there's a true story with it. How do you know who the head of 36 I don't know. You don't know. But the guy who is the head, he knows. Okay? The boss is somewhere... Well, he only God is the boss, but then he has his thirty-six hidden righteous, and listen, there's there's many stories to tell, and we'll tell them, okay? But I I, I happen to know it because there's a true story they tell about the Schwarze Wolf. Do you know the story about the Schwarze Wolf? Uh, I couldn't even say that. The black wolf, the black. Schwarze Wolf. wolf. Okay, about hundred and fifty years ago. There was a couple who didn't have any children, very heartbreaking, lived for many years married and no children, and decided he was going to go travel to his Rebbe in another city and say, Rebbe, you got to give me a bra. And he traveled to that city and he went and he waited and he saw his Rebbe and his Rebbe takes him around the arms and he looks up at the sky and he cries, his Rebbe, and he says, the gates are closed, there's no way, there's no way. I can't do anything in order to get facilitate a bracha for you to have children. And the guy goes, no way, Rebbe. There's got to be a way. It's, it, it, I can't go on like this. Me and my wife, we can't. There's got to be a way. He says, well, if you, if you go to the head, we call him Lamed Vav, because Lamed Vav means 36. If you go to the head of the 36, on Shabbos, and you get a bracha from him, he can probably do it. And the guy goes, well, Tell me who it is. Who is it? He says, you might know him. He lives in your town. Hmm. Who? Who? Schwarzwolf. Schwarzwolf! That guy, he's so obnoxious and disgusting. Everybody moves away from him. Nobody greets him on Shabbos. Every time he comes around, everybody moves away. That guy? Yeah. Head of the, head, head of the 36. Okay? If you can get to him on Shabbos, then you'll get a bracha. Okay? Okay, so the guy plans, he gets, you know, he says to his wife, this is the plan, I'm going to knock on his door. He lives like outskirts of the city in the forest, right? I'm going to knock on his door two minutes before Shabbos. And say, I'm stuck, I can't get back, can I stay here for Shabbos? That's how, right? Okay, he goes there, knocks on the door, it's two minutes before Shabbos. The wife answers, right, and she's screaming obscenities at him, you disgusting maggot, get the back out of my house, right? She wants to slam the door in his face, he puts his foot in the door, right? He sees the kids behind, right? And they're all so obnoxious and throwing things around. But he's not freaked out because there's a big rule. And the big rule is when you see a flaw, specifically in a rabbi, really if you see a flaw in anybody else, really it's your flaw, okay? But it definitely in a holy rabbi, when you see the flaws, it's really the flaws inside of you. And then you have to fix them inside of you, and then you won't see them anymore in that way. So he understood, because his Rebbe told him, this is the head of the Lamed Vav. So you're walking into this thing, and you're going to be, you know, it's going to be like a tossy, turvy sea, you know, you don't know, but it's all you, 
Okay? So the wife says, go into the barn and wait for my husband to come home. So he goes into the barn and he waits there for the husband to come home. And he hears the footsteps of the Shvartzavov who is praying in the forest. He comes in right just before Shabbos. He goes and he hears him going to his house. A little conversation with the wife. Blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden he comes out from the house and he comes to the barn and the door slams open and he sees the silhouette, this massive guy, big guy, the Shvartzavov, big guy. And he says, you're here for Shabbos. As soon as Shabbos is out, you, you take off. And if you step foot in my house, I'll kill you on the spot. Poof! <laughs> <laughs> and he walks back into his house. <laughs> the guy's like, okay. He prays the entire Shabbos. He prays, he prays, he prays the entire Shabbos. Hashem, please. Let me not leave without this blessing the entire night. He could barely sleep. Thank God he brought some wine and some, some challahs to sustain him because they, they, he's with the horses, okay? Oh. Shabbos is about to go down. The sun is about to set. He realizes he has to leave as soon as Shabbos goes out and he's praying. He breaks down. He's on his knees as the sun is going down. And finally, he feels this very subtle tap on his shoulder. And he turns around and it's the Schwarz of Lord but he doesn't look the same. He looks like Mamish, the high priest on Yom Kippur. He's just shining with a radiance. And he says, My dear darling friend, my holy brother, I know why you come. I want to invite you to my house for how to have the holy third meal on Shabbos. And he goes in, and of course, the wife is exquisitely beautiful. And the little kids are like little high priests. And it's an unbelievable ambiance. And he sits down with the holy... The holy uh, uh, and he says, I'm going to give you a blessing that you should have a child on the condition that you'll name him the name, same name as mine. And he doesn't think much of it. Sephardi, maybe, uh, you know, they carry the same names. He doesn't think much, you know, because usually Ashkenaz don't have a name of a person, right? Anyways, for sure he got the bracha. Goes home, he's so excited. Told his wife, I got the bracha. And what happened is the next morning he goes, he's going to shul, and there's a big commotion in shul. There's a guy, there's, there's, the, the gabbai is trying to get people around and everybody's screaming at the gabbai. And he goes, what's, what's going on? He says, someone died last night. Schwarzenberg. And the guy bangs on the, on the bima in the synagogue and he says, this guy was the head. The head of the 36. And you guys wouldn't even say hello to him. Okay? You'd go to the other side of the street, you would avoid him. And he was the head. He could have gotten the, any blessing that you would have needed. Okay? It would have helped you with anything. And what happened is, okay, he got a minion together, they buried him. A year later, he has a kid, names him Schwarzwald. The story's not over. How do, I, how do we know this is true? Because the Belza Rebbe, 1948, had a tish in Tel Aviv. A tish means literally a table, right? A Hasidic, right? And the way that they do it, the Hasidic Rebbe's do it, is... You know, people will come to him individually at a certain point, and he says, asks them their name, and he says a little l'chaim, you know. And at one point in time, they're escorting. Two men are holding this very old man, and he asks the old man, what's your name? And the old man says, Schwarzwolf. He says, maybe, are you a grandson or a great-grandson of the original Schwarzwolf, Schwarzwolf that was head of the, the Lamed Vav, the 36? And the old man goes, Rebbe, you know the story. He says, yes, I know the story but I'm not going to tell it. You're going to tell it. They put the old man on the table. He had quiet. All the Hasidim stood, st stood around as the old man told the tale of the Schwarzwolf and why his name is Schwarzwolf. And then Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, who tells the story way better than I did, okay? Unbelievable. Uh, he was telling the story at one concert. Somehow it occurred to him. And all of a sudden, there was a guy in the back row, scream, scream. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, I... I'm a Rebbe. I teach in a school. I'm a school teacher. And I have a boy in my class whose name is Schwarzwolf. And he's a great grandson of that guy. So wow. it's passed down. So from there, I answer your question. I don't know about every one of the 36, but I do know that I think the head one pretty much has an idea. So in the beginning of the Baal Shem Tov's life, okay, I'll, uh, there's a lot of stories that go into it, but well, I want to get to the letter because it's very important. Okay? Is... Um, he was a nister, a nister which means he was hidden. And he would know all of the other tzaddikim too. They knew. And they would travel around to try to help the people and bring them close. So he would dress up as a poor beggar, right? 
until finally he had to be revealed. Eliyahu came to Elijah the prophet came to him and explained to him why he had to be revealed. And he came out and he became a revealed Rebbe. And, and therefore he started to expound on his teachings. And the teachings became very widespread, very popular. Okay, because it was like an unbelievable dynamic breath of fresh air of how to practice Judaism and feel connected in a way that nobody ever felt before. Really, it's the Torah. He just revealed stuff that was always there as we're going to explore. This is the book that we're going to do. It's called Keter Shem Tov or Keser Shem Tov. Okay, this is a translation of just a, it's, it's not even a full translation, but it's what we have to go on because the Baal Shem Tov never wrote anything. He had his Talmudim, his students, and after he passed away, they wrote. And so people went and they collected his teachings and put them in forms. Like I have one is the Baal Shem Tov on the Torah. Um, they have Keser Shem Tov, it's Fata Rivash, there's different. So he's called the Baal Shem Tov, literally that means master of the good name. Master of the good name, I guess you would call somebody who's a Baal Shem, a Baal Shem which means master of a name, which means they could pronounce a name which means basically we'll call it miracle worker. Because what he did was he um, was able to perform many, many miracles. The stories are unbelievable in terms of the miracles that he did for people. Women who couldn't give birth, people who were sick, all kinds of ailments, all kinds of predicaments, all kinds of harsh uh, judgments that people, he was, he, he was an unbelievable influence in the time. And the influence, of course, because of his students, through his students then, of course, spread abroad all of his teachings, and that's why you have the different sects of the different Hasidim. You might be familiar with Breslov Hasidim, Lubavitch Hasidim, there's Babav, there's Satmar, all kinds, depending upon where in Europe that they were. Okay, But basically, he was the master and the founder of this Hasidic movement. So he never wrote anything except this, what we're going to do today. Okay, because This... Oddly enough, okay, because there's so much to explore about it. Isn't that good? Yeah. Pass them out. All these good dollars. Yeah. So, several books were put together to collect his teachings. Some of them, and I'm going to be honest with you, I do not understand them all. Okay? But we do have to... So his real name was Rabbi Yisrael ben Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, Rabbi Yisroel, that was his real name, Yisroel. And he was the son of a man by the name of Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer and his, and his wife, how did they merit to have such a child? So they were basically very, very big in welcoming guests. As a matter of fact, he would go out of his way and welcome in guests and bring them in and treat them unbelievably high, like kings and queens, and when he would escort them, he would give them food and money on their way out to make sure that they had all their needs. Whatever it is, he put all his energy into welcoming guests, and they made a huge ruckus. Do you know what a ruckus is? In Shemayim, in heaven, a big tumult, big tumult in heaven about his, this mitzvah that he did of welcoming guests. And basically, the ruckus that was made in heaven was they were saying, somebody's got to test him because he's worthy of bringing down a very holy soul through his good deed. He has aroused that there should be some kind of holy soul coming into this world. But we have to test him first. So the Sutton says, I'll go. But Eliyahu says, let me go. So Eliyahu the Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, he agrees to go to the test. And how is it done? few versions of the story. Basically, it's after Shabbos, right? After services. Everybody's going to go to their houses and have Shabbat. And he comes into town with a backpack, leather jacket, maybe some earrings, maybe smoking a cigarette. I don't think so. But anyways, uh, okay. But he comes in as obviously some roughneck guy looking for a place for Shabbos. After Shabbos, he's carrying. We don't do this kind of stuff. Everybody's like, you know, you understand they're coming from a very religious neighborhood and this stuff, just you don't do that. It's like you don't, you know, whatever. So certain things you just don't do. Except Rabbi Eliezer says, come, come to my house. And he has him sit at the table. And, he, and, and of course the guy is pretty obnoxious, the entire food, you know. What do you think about him? 
you know, whatever, you know. Mannerisms a little bit coarse, right? Maybe a lot coarse. We don't really know what goes on, but I'm sure we can fabricate certain things about him being uh, testing patients. Anyways, the guy was totally cool. The whole Shabbos, him and his wife, with open, with a, with a willing and, and, a, and joyous heart, served their guest and other guests as well. And finally, at the end of Shabbos, he's escorting him outside of town. And of course, then at that point in time, Elijah turns to him and says, you know, I'm not who you think I am, right? And he reveals that he's Elijah the prophet, and he gives him a blessing that he will have a, a child that will alter the way that Judaism is practiced. And of course, he gave birth to the Baal Shem Tov. So without any further ado, let's look at this letter, okay? This is the only thing that he actually did write. Everything else was from his students. And like I say, this is very close to my heart for many reasons, okay? I learned this with my father-in-law, and I don't know, there's just some kind of connection that I feel that everybody at a certain point in time falls in love with a Rebbe. And, and everybody usually falls in love with their, with like the, the Lavacher Hasidim fall in love with their Rebbe, right? The, the Breslov fall in love with their Rebbe. My Rebbe is the Baal Hashem Tov, okay? The founder of the Hasidic movement. And I've gone through his stories. I read his story. I read through several books of his stories with all my kids when they were to put him to sleep. That was my bedtime story. So the stories blew me away. So here he writes, uh, here, here's how he goes. To my beloved brother-in-law, my friend who is dear to me as my own heart and soul, the exalted rabbi and chassid, renowned for his Torah scholarship and fear of heaven, our master, Rabbi Avram Gershon, may his light shine. Peace unto him and his family, his modest wife, Bluma, together with all their children. May they be blessed with life. Amen. That's how he introduces the letter. Actually, he sent the letter, but the letter never got there, because if the letter got there, we wouldn't have it. Somehow the letter, the letter never got there. That's why we have the letter. Okay? So he says, I received the letter written by your holy hand. Rabbi Gershon, Rabbeinu Gershon, was his brother-in-law. Okay? There's a whole story about them two together, because, don't forget, oh, oh, we'll get into it later. Lots of stories, I can never stop. I received a letter written by your holy hand, which you sent by means of the emissary from Jerusalem at the fair of Luca in the year 55. 10, which is 1750. It was written with extreme brevity, explaining that you already written at length to each of us individually and had sent those letters by means of a certain man en route to Egypt. Okay. However, the letters never arrived, and I was sorely grieved that I never saw the work of your holy hand, which was written in greater detail. Assuredly, this is due to the calamitous state of the many lands in which the plague has spread because of our many transgressions. Okay. You know, we're taught that if there's any Thing that happens, calamities in the world, we're taught that we have to look at ourselves. That's a basic Jewish idea everywhere in the world. It's, so, it's kind of weird for me to say this. It's the fault of the Jews. Okay? What? Now, that doesn't mean it's the fault of the Jews. Let's get rid of them. Okay? That's what, how we look upon ourselves as it, we are, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing because if we were doing what we're supposed to be doing, the world would be at peace, okay? All the time of King Solomon's reign, the world was completely at peace. There was no disasters anywhere, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, nowhere, okay? It was like a golden era, in the, not only in Israel, but in the entire world, okay? And we have to get back to that. It's about taking responsibility and it's about thinking about our deeds and how we can correct ourselves. We do have a profound effect on the world, okay? So that's why he says the plague is spread because of our many transgressions, okay? Not far from our region, the pestilence has reached the holy community of Mohilev as well as Wallachia and Turkey, okay? That's not like Waxahachie. Right? It's better than Waxahachie. Okay. Your letter also states that the Torah teachings and mystical revelations which I sent you through the rabbi and preacher of the Holy Community of Polonia did not reach you. This too caused me great distress. 
it certainly would have given you great joy if they had reached you. I have since forgotten many of those teachings. However, the few details I still remember, I will write to you in brief. So here's what we have of those letters. They were, I guess, longer in the earlier letters, and now it's just he's giving it in brief. And this is why this is so popular. You're going to find out right now. Okay? On Rosh Hashanah of the year 5507, that's 1746, I made a Kabbalistic oath and elevated my soul in the manner known to you. Which means they were basically how, able to do out-of-body experiences. Okay? So this is on a Rosh Hashanah evening where he was, his, took his soul, was able to go with a meditation and go into the higher realms to hear what's going to be decreed upon the uh, community in the coming year. I saw wondrous things in a vision, the likes of which I had never witnessed since the day my mind first began to awaken. That's like three years old for him, okay? For us, we're still working on it. The things that I saw and learned when I ascended there would be impossible to communicate. Even if I could speak to you in person, the words, I can't find words for what I really experienced. When I returned to what's called the Lower Garden of Eden, there's an Upper Garden of Eden. There's something called the Lower Garden of Eden. Okay? You just got to know. It's just addresses in the spiritual realm. Okay? So when I returned to the Lower Garden of Eden, I saw many souls, both living and dead, some known to me and others unknown. Their number was beyond reckoning. In other words, countless number of souls. They were hastening to and fro in order to ascend from one world to another through the column known to those initiated into the mysteries. In other words, in the spiritual realm, there's something called a column where all the souls will go up and down. Okay? Don't know if it's a physical column. Obviously not. But it's called the column. Okay? So here he was in this column and he sees... Huge amount of souls, some living and some dead. In other words, living is probably they're, they're, they're sleeping, right? And, but their souls are flying, and some people who had already passed away. Their joy was too great for the mouth to express, or the physical ear to hear. In other words, it was an unbelievable joy. Also, many evildoers were repenting, and their sins were being forgiven. Since it was a special time of divine favor. Even to me it was amazing how many of them were accepted as penitents because he knew some of these guys who died, some of these wicked people, and he's going, what? That guy got off? Right? Something that we would be astounded, and he was also astounded. That guy? How can he? What? Okay. There was great joy among them too, and they ascended in the same manner. Together they begged and implored me unceasingly because of the glory of your Torah, God has granted you an additional measure of understanding to grasp and know these matters. Ascend with us. That's what they were saying. Ascend with us so that you can be our help and support. So all these souls, they noticed the Baal Shem Tov hanging out there and they're going, come up, Rebbe, Rebbe, come up. Come up with us. And they're like, <laughs> he doesn't know if he should go up. Because of the great joy that I beheld among them, I agreed to go up with them. And I besought my master, Achia Hashiloni, to accompany me. Who is Achia Hashiloni? Achia Hashiloni was a prophet in the time of King Solomon. Apparently, the Baal Shem Tov, at one point in his life, right, through all of his meditations and all of his rectifications and all of his prayers, all of a sudden he came, he got a dream. And the dream, an old man came to him and he says, meet me at the cave, the third rock, the third mountain of the Carpathian Mountains. Meet me, there's a cave there in the third mountain. Meet me there Tuesday, one o'clock, be there. You don't have a watch? Find one, okay? So he didn't take anything of it. And then he had to dream the next night, right? Next Tuesday, be there, right? <laughs> then he had a dream the another night. He still, he wasn't, come on, it's just a dream. Why should I take it? And then he goes into the mikvah, you know, the ritual bath. They would do this every day as the ways of the, the Hasidim. And when he was in, his, his 
custom was to hold his eyes open when he would go into the water. So his eyes were open. He went in and he saw the face of the guy in his dream and says, I'm serious. You get your tochas over there. I don't know about tochas. Okay? I'm serious. So he says, okay, I better take it seriously. So he went. He goes there in the cave and there's a table. There's a candle and there's books. And there's an old man. And he sits and he learns with the old man. And the old man is teaching the mysteries of the universe. And day after day he goes till finally after a certain period of time it was revealed to him who he is and he became terribly frightened because it really wasn't it was a it was somebody who had it was a prophet who had lived thousands of years before right and obviously he's experiencing this person teaching this and who am I okay but nevertheless Achia Hashilani was his spirit teacher okay and there have been many rabbis who also had spirit teachers Magid they call him the, the, the rabbi of the Shulchan Aruch had a, a Magid, somebody who would teach him also the mysteries and things like that. And there were many, okay? The, Bal, the, the, the Vilna Gon, though, the genius of Vilna, he actually had an, a, a Magid, where these angelic creatures come and says, I'm here to teach you the entire Torah, I'm going to teach you the mysteries. And the, and, and the Vilna Gon says, no, no, I don't want it. Why not? He says, because I want to work for it. We're here to work for it. I want to earn it, okay? No f- cheap freebie, okay? In any case, uh, so I besought my master, Achia Hashiloni, to accompany me, for the ascent to the spiritual worlds is fraught with danger. He actually had an experience once where he was having his Shabbos nap. Anybody take a nap on Shabbos? Shabbos nap, Sunday, uh, Shane Shabbos, Shabbos Tanuk, sometimes the most pleasant of sleeps. He was there, and all of a sudden his soul was in such a heavenly realm. And he was in this unbelievable palace. And these unbelievable other holy souls were there and going, Stay with us. There's so much we can explore together. And he was going to, until his, his, his wife shook him. Yisrael, get up! And he says, If you didn't wake me up, I would have died. My soul would have left my body. would not have come back. Okay? Fraught with danger. These kind of dangers. Also, you might meet some entities there that are not so friendly. From the day of my birth until now, I've never experienced such an ascent as this. I went from level to level until I entered the palace of Mashiach. Here's where everybody grabs hold of this. This is the one line that everybody quotes. Okay? Now he finally goes level and level and level till he reaches the hall of the Holy Mashiach, the Holy Messiah where Mashiach studies with the sages and righteous as well as with the seven shepherds. The seven shepherds are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and David. There are seven shepherds. They're called the seven shepherds, okay? Seven righteous, the star righteous. So Lahad Sadiqim, the Mashiach is there. There I found extremely great rejoicing, really happy beyond. But I did not know the cause of this delight. At first I thought that it might be due to my having passed away from the physical world. Maybe Did I die? Is that why you guys are so happy? Maybe I died? He, they, right? Later they told me, no, 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 you didn't die. They ha- actually, they said the opposite. They have such great pleasure on high when you do your mystical unifications in the world below through the, your holy Torah. That's what they told him. Okay? In other words, the things that you do, the prayers that you say, oh, such delight. We get such pleasure. Interesting how what goes on in the spiritual dimensions. Okay? However, to this very day, the nature of their joy still remains unknown to me. This is what he writes. Now, I asked the Mashiach, which anybody else would ask the same question. When will you come, Master? When does the will the master come? That's the literal Hebrew. When is the master coming already? Okay? And he replied, By this you shall know. It will be a time when your teachings become publicized and revealed to the world, and your wellsprings have overflowed to the outside. It will be, it will be when that which I have taught you and that which you have perceived of your own efforts become known so that others too 
will be able to perform mystical unifications and a sense of the soul like you. Okay? So in other words, your teachings, when everybody will be able to practice your teachings, then all of the evil klipot, that means the evil forces, will be destroyed, and there will be a time of grace and salvation, and that's when I'm coming. So the Mashiach answers him, when am I, when am I coming? When your teaching is spread about, and everybody's practicing what your teaching is about, what you're talking about, okay? Now you have to look at this a little bit deeper here, okay? We get the part of the, right? We get the part of when your teachings become revealed to the world, the wellsprings have overflowed to the outside. The interesting thing, the question that I had is, it will be that which I have taught you. In other words, what I've already taught you which is an interesting idea when you think about it. Wait a minute. Did we meet before? (laughs) How could it be something that you already taught me? Right? And then it goes on to say, what you perceived of your own efforts, okay? Anything that you have made novel. So that others too will be able to form mystical unifications and a sense of the soul like you. In other words, a mystical unification is like a meditation. Now, an ascent of the soul is like an out-of-body experience, I would think. Okay? A soul ascent. In other words, when everybody's going to be able to practice the soul ascents like you, that's that's when I'm coming. Right? Now, think about that. What's occurring in your mind right now? So this is what he says. I was amazed at this and greatly troubled since a long time has passed for this to be possible. When's it going to happen? As my father-in-law, Zuchusa Yagen Elena, would say, when's that truck driver going to go ahead and do an out-of-body experience? Right? Right? And when's that going to happen? Yeah, right. Okay? But while I was there, I learned three segulot and three holy names that are easy to learn and explain. Now, what is a segula? Have you ever heard of the word segula before? That's a melody. No, that's a nigun. A segula is basically a, a practice, an act, that can perpetuate a certain manifestation. Okay? They do it a lot. For example, the main classic example was a segula to get married let's say, is to hold, at a wedding, to hold the chuppah pole. Hold one of the poles of the, of the chuppah. It was, is a segula. It's an act that can perpetuate you to be next, to, or not, or to get married. Okay? That's called a segula. There's so many. There's, I have a whole book of segulas. Okay? Right? Segula for a lost object. That's the classic one. I should share that with you. You'll probably yeah. lose your car keys. Yeah. Right, I'll give you that one. My mother-in-law, she's amazing with it. She really, she's like spot on. Okay? It's scary. It's scary. We lost our car keys. We were in the car. I'm with my father-in-law. We're in the car. We're ready to go. Where are the car keys? I thought you put them. I put them on the table. I put them on the camera. Where are the, where are the, car, where are the car keys? We sent my mother-in-law in the house. Right? Two-story house, five-bedroom, San Antonio. She comes out with the car keys. Right? She does, I'm a Rebbe Binyamin. I could, right? says, In other words, Rabbi ben, there's a, it's called the Amma Rabbi Binyamin. Rabbi Benjamin says, everything is in a status quo of being blind to the eyes. In other words, the eyes can't see it. But God opens the eyes, right, of Israel. And then you start, to, and then you give a little coin to Rabbi Meir Balanes, old Sadaka, right? Say a few other things, and then you start looking. So this is what she did. She went in the house, came out, I'm telling you, like three minutes later with the keys. Where were they? In the dryer. Upstairs was a dryer, inside the dryer. Okay? Now, my father-in-law just turns to me so nonchalantly. I'll never forget his face, how he looks to me. He goes, I'm married to a witch. (laughs) I would never think of looking in the dryer. You know, there are many, 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 many segulas, okay? It's bizarre, okay? 
the idea here is a segula is like an act that can perpetuate, like, you know, a, a, a certain manifestation, okay? Like a segula for, um, there's a segula on Shabbat, it's a great one. I'm just not going to go over every one of them. It's coming whatever occurs to my head. I'm telling you there are thousands of them. That, uh, that when, after you break bread and, and, you, and, you, and you distribute the bread to everybody, there's always crumbs on the breadboard. So there's a segula for to get rich is to go like this and gather them and eat the bread crumbs. Segula to be wealthy, for wealth. I know you're going to do it this Friday. Okay? <laughs> Pass that money. Give me that breadcrumbs. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So uh, they also have, it's also, there's some that are explicit, explicit in the halacha. Some are explicit in the halacha that um, breadcrumbs on the floor, you better, you have to watch out and not step on because that brings poverty. There's negative segulot as well. Okay, and, and they, by the, that it bleeds into real halacha. Those really actually have their effect in there. Anyway, so he's pretty. So first, he's really troubled. He's like, "When is it gonna happen? Where the guy, where the guy, the, the mailman, and the milkman, and the guy, and the, and, and and the truck driver is gonna be able to just do out of body experiences and do these kind of meditations when the mashiach's gonna come? It sounds like I don't know when the mashiach's gonna come because when is that gonna happen?" So he says, they revealed to me three segulo, these three actions, and three holy names that are easy to learn and to explain. My mind was then set at ease. And I thought that with these teachings, the people of my own generation might attain the same spiritual level and state as myself. So he feels great, awesome. It could be done. It can be done. They would be able to elevate their souls, and learn and perceive just as I do. However, I was not granted permission to reveal this during my lifetime. I pleaded for your sake, because he's, he's, he's writing this to his brother-in-law, I pleaded for your sake to be allowed to teach you, but I was denied permission altogether and took an oath to that effect. I'm not allowed to tell. It's like, then what would you tell me for if I can't say it? Yeah. The, uh, to cut to the chase, he hid it in the letter. Okay, it's hidden in the letter. Not that I have it and I can tell you, but it, it's hidden in the letter. I know one. God revealed to me one. God revealed to me one thing. Okay? Not, I, I'm not saying it's it. I'm not saying it's it at all. Okay? But, you know, I, I'm writing a book that our thoughts create angels. And I, re, and I speak about in this book that there's one angel that can overcome all of the negative angels that we've been creating our entire life. And the name of that angel is Easy. 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 Why? Because if you are approaching anything in your life and you say hard, can't, or impossible, you are creating a reality. You are creating an experience of hard or impossible. So therefore, if you keep saying that and keep thinking that because it's estimated you think around 60,000 thoughts a day, so therefore that's 60,000 angels, and if you keep saying can't, so you virtually really built a wall. So the only thing that can get you through such a predicament is to say, easy. Now, that doesn't mean the solution to your problem is right there. It is, there is, you just can't see it, okay? But if you keep saying hard, difficult, or whatever... So then you are blocking the answer or the solution to your problem. But if you say easy, because for God, everything is easy. It's us who get in the way. Okay? For God, it's all easy. So if you say easy, right? So then you are allowing yourself to be open to the possibilities of the solutions to manifest themselves. Okay? And he says it in those words. He says those three names, right? Right? The three names are, actually, this is what he says, okay? Behem benakel lilmod ulafaresh. Because he says that if you look at the exact words, the shloshet devarim segulot, shemot hakadoshim, and the three holy names, behem, and they are 
But not gel il mode ulafares. Easy to learn and to teach. So I look at the word easy, and that's where I had the idea. That if you say easy, at least you're opening up a channel. Okay? In any case, he was not given permission to see it, say it, but they there are people, there are Hasidim who read this letter every single day because and they were able to go ahead and see future things through learning this letter and studying and meditating on this letter. Okay? So it's hidden in the letter. Yet this I can tell you, and may God assist you, so that your way be pleasant to God, to the God, to the Lord. Never stray, particularly in the Holy Land, whenever you pray or study, and with every utterance of your lips, from intending to bring about the unification of a divine name. For every letter contains worlds and souls and holiness. And they ascend and combine and unite with one another. Okay? So here is where they brought this letter, actually, in a certain section of the book, in Parsha's Noah. The Parsha of Noah, if you're familiar with, Noah was commanded to make an ark. And it says in the instructions that God gave him to make an ark, he says, Sohar ta'ase la teva, which means you have to make, they literally translate it as, you make a window for the ark. Okay? Now other commentaries say you have to bring some kind of luminous stone or a window. There has to be some kind of light in there. It's a box, right? Dark box. How are you going to get around, right? Gee, I hope that you, no one knocks over the candle. Well, we're, we're in a lot of trouble, Right? So he makes, but the Baal Shem Tov now takes those three words and he takes it to a whole different level. And from this whole level, you get a whole new different understanding of Noah and the Ark. That is beyond. Okay? And when he says the words, so har taseleteva, make so har can be understood as shining. So har, which means in Hebrew, shining. Taseleteva, teva means ark, but it also means word. It's the same Hebrew word, same spelling, exactly. So really, if you would look at it in a different way, a different nuance, you make the word to shine. Sohar ta'ase leteva, which means make your words to shine. I think we spoke about this last week, about shining with a mitzvah, Right? This, we're talking about when you make an utterance, when you pray, or even just meditate, and you make a letter, and you join it with another letter, and another letter, and another, to try to use that as a meditative technique to picture in your mind's eye the letters shining. There's a lot of background. I'm just giving you like a real gist of it. The tip of the iceberg about a meditative technique that's been handed down for generations. Okay? And he says now, the interesting, the dynamic thing is just like the ark had three stories. It had an upper, middle, and, and lower story. So he says here that the words, letters, also have three divisions. Okay? Just like the ark has three divisions. Did he, did he say that yet, or am I jumping ahead? Jumping ahead. Jumping ahead. Then the letters combine and unite to form a word, and they are actually unified with the divine essence. And in all these aspects, your soul is bound up with them. All the worlds become unified as one, and they ascend and bring about great joy and delight without measure. Consider the joy of a bridegroom and a bride in, in this lowly physical world, and you will realize how much greater is the joy on such a lofty spiritual level. In other words, he's hinting to a very dynamic meditative technique that a person could actually use the letters... And the letters become your ark. In other words, listen, folks, and, I, and we know it now more than ever, we're bombarded, seriously, okay? All the time. If you're, if you're not bombarded by your cell phone and what's coming out of your cell phones, right? Even just sitting here in a room, all the waves of what TV, phone, radio waves are bouncing all off the entire atmosphere. These waves, don't think they don't affect you. 
and then it'll affect your mind. Okay? Literally, we are in a kind of a flood. It's a different kind of flood. It's not a flood of water. Right? It's also a flood of information. Too much information. Right? So, there is... One second. Now I know what to do. So we're living in a flood of sorts. We're bombarded. Media, forget it. Everything. We're constantly bombarded. You know? In the days where we didn't have cell phones, how quiet was our existence? Okay? Right? It was nice. Okay? And when you had TVs that had to be hooked up to a wall instead of like a TV in every bathroom, where there was one TV in the living room, we all were raised on that, okay? And before that, there was a time where there were no TVs, right? Or there's a radio, okay? But the radio's in the kitchen or whatever, okay? It keeps on going, right? So, Sorry. we're bombarded. And so, it, we're in a flood. So, how do you escape it? So, he's giving you a method, just like Noah goes into the ark and he escapes this, the, hit, the flood of water, we go into the Word, and we escape the flood that's going on around us. Okay? I cannot describe to you, because I've been practicing this for a long time, this technique, in, in my prayers. I'm not, I'm not saying I got it down. I asked my father-in-law, I'm like, well, come on! Every single word of prayer to do this? You'd be there for five hours at least, just for one service. He said, start with the bait of bark. Okay? Just the bait of borrow. And so the idea here is that every time you say a letter, you're making a connection. And there's a lot more to describe, and we'll get to it. Okay? In terms of, let's say, the connection of one letter, because really everything is made up of letters. Mystically, the way we understand it, coming from Sharyichud Vemuna, different, all the mystical texts say that God made ten utterances and created the world. And those utterances that God made are constantly giving every single thing its vitality and its existence. When God said, let there be light, let there be a firmament, let there be dry land, it's not that he's like us, we say a statement and we go away. It's those statements are still being uttered and the letters of those statements are still giving every single thing its existence. The real masters, when they walk into a room, right, they don't see a chair. They see chaf samech hey, which is the letter, Hebrew letters of a chair. They don't see a table, they say Shin Lamed Chet Nun. When they see a beam, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, right before he passed away, or the previous one, he says, look. And he was telling the people, which they didn't see it, but he saw the letters, and he was telling them the letters that he saw. The internal spiritual dynamic of existence behind everything. And it's a training. We have to Listen, it's a training, okay? In any case, the idea really here is that he's, that he's telling us is, that he's telling his brother-in-law, have in mind. It's kind of like a type of mindfulness. As a matter of fact, I think he's one of the teachers, the, the original person who brought out this idea of being mindful. Okay? To try to attune to something deeper that usually people will pass by. Okay? So here he goes on. God will surely help you. Wherever you turn, you will succeed and become enlightened. Give wisdom to the wise, and he will become wise. All the more, and he'll become wise all the more. The Kesser Shem Tov version ends here, okay? But then there's a little bit more here. He says, please pray for my sake that I might be privileged to dwell in God's land during my lifetime, and pray for the remnant of our people who still remain in the diaspora. These are the words of your brother-in-law, who longs to see our fa you face to face, who prays that length of days be granted to you and your wife and children, and who wishes you peace all your days, including the nights, for many good years. Amen. Actually, that is not really the entire letter, 
There's much more of the letter that he says that he did in another Rosh Hashanah he did up. He went up and he saw the Satan prosecuting and the pro- Satan, the, the angel of death was prosecuting. Very happy! He was prosecuting and he saw that there was a time of great destruction that was going to befall the community in Europe. And he prayed and he says, you gotta, you gotta, you, you can't do this. And he made unbelievable prayers and they say, okay, we're going to delay it, we're going to push it off and, and in exchange, it, there'll be a great weakness throughout the generations. In other words, the Jewish community will suffer a weakness. In other words, it's the strength of Torah learning, the strength of connection is going to get weaker. And then when the Baal Shem Tov came out of that, that out-of-body experience, so he started to, to read, uh, he started to get his students early in the morning, and they would read the Ketoret. Ketoret is the incense. There's a big segula, and also a segula, a special act for, to be rich, okay, is to read the incense offering. It's in every prayer book that you read the incense, the 11 spices of the incense, because mm-hmm. really, in one, son, in one hand, it chases away the angel of death, and in the temple times, they would never let a priest who did the incense do it twice. In other words, once you did it, that was it. You could never do it again. They had to give it to a new guy every time because it's said to bring about wealth. So people read it, actually, every day, right? But it's said to avert also evil decrees, to read the incense. It's in the sitter. Anyway, so he was getting together wee hours and reading it, and then the Satan, the angel of death, comes in and says, I thought we had a deal. What are you doing, man? You're not supposed to be doing this, man. You're chasing me away. You're stopping my, you know, you're hurting my business. You're hurting my business. So in any case, so then he had to stop, okay? But the people read this every day. They would read this letter, okay? It was actually obligatory by this, uh, a certain tzaddik from Menash, Menashchiz, okay? He would learn it every day. He would never detract, just like putting on tefillin. From there he did learn the three names. But he did not mention those names. But they are hinted in secret in this letter. And it's possible to know by way of them the end of days. In other words, how the... So the bottom line is, okay? And that is why all of the Hasidim are very excited. Because why? If we teach the Baal Shem Tov teachings to the degree that we can, then we'll bring Mashiach. The world is just gone too haywire. Unbelievable suffering all over, and we would like to see an end. So, a way to do that would be to study his teachings. Okay? So if we can study his teachings, get them to the degree that we can. In order to get it more out there, at least this is what we can do in terms of bringing the Mashiach I'm bringing. You have a question? No, no. I'm just trying to think. You're saying that in this letter...